Sig Chi Lifetime Practice Award uh, session. It's my great honor as the uh, chairman of the Sig Chi Awards Committee to uh, uh, help uh, select these uh, great awards. Uh, I'm Brad Myers from Carnegie Mellon University, and today's honoree is Larry Tesler. Um, Bill Buxton, in his talk, uh, emphasized how it's very difficult to attribute uh, certain inventions to companies or people overclaim uh, when they uh, really shouldn't be taking credit for things. But I don't think there's any doubt that uh, what we have uh, in Larry Tesler is actually a uh, unique uh, individual who has personally contributed many of the interaction techniques that virtually everybody in the entire world uses on a daily basis, which is pretty uh, awesome to be able to identify that. Uh, in particular, the copy and paste mechanisms that we all use uh, are his uh, personal invention. But uh, this isn't the one cool invention award. This is a lifetime practice award, and there certainly is uh, an enormous number of other things that Larry is uh, rightly credited for, including uh, the popularity of avoiding modes in interaction when unnecessary. The, I, he was the first person to do usability studies at Xerox PARC. He uh, contributed to the browser that we uh, uh, was originally used for code. He contributed to the uh, uh, various other uh, textual interaction techniques. And then he went on to Apple and led the group that developed the uh, Lisa and then the Macintosh and many of the uh, interaction techniques that were developed there. Uh, close to my heart and my research, he also helped uh, the uh, first uh, object-oriented toolkit development in the Lisa toolkit and the Mac app system. Uh, then he helped with uh, Apple's research on animation, 3D graphics, speech synthesis, <coughs> scientific visualization and many other um, contributions that Apple made over the years before they tragically closed their research labs. Um, and he's uh, subsequently worked at Amazon and Yahoo, uh, so I don't think there's any doubt that in terms of the Im impact on HCI practice for both uh, the people who create interfaces and the uh, virtually entire world who uses interfaces, that Larry Tesler uh, richly deserves the award for uh, Lifetime Practice Award. Well, welcome, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone involved for uh, honoring me with this award. Uh, I'm going to spend part of this talk justifying maybe why I got it, but most of the talk uh, destroying most of what Brad said about me uniquely creating these things because just in summary of the talk is they were all team efforts and I was uh, a player throughout but I was definitely not uh, the only person that made these things happen. I could never have done it alone. So the title of the talk is what's it like to design a user interface for six billion people, six thousand million and that is something I hope to convey uh, with the stories I'll be telling. Brad gave you a summary of my career history, and this is a, a chart that breaks it down into pieces. As they say, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. My career oscillated between technology research and product development. It also oscillated between doing engineering and doing user experience design and testing. And most of all, it oscillated between being a manager, managing a lot of the people who did a lot of the things that Brad said. They did the work and deserved the credit. But I hope that I created an environment that encouraged that, that to happen. Uh, but also, inter intermittently between management assignments, I would go through a period of working on my own or having a small team and making actual individual contributions. And I love doing that. I started as a consultant in the 60s, and I am currently consulting again, full circle. But uh, today I'll be talking about the first half of my career, which is 
the 60s, the, mainly the 70s when I was at Park is what I'll be talking about a lot, and a little bit about the 80s when I was at Apple, just uh, some, of the, some of the things that happened there that, that uh, closed the chapter that I started at Park. In a lot of ways, I was just kind of in the right place at the right time, but I also uh, was, felt very strongly about making systems usable for people and became a very passionate advocate, especially for modeless interaction, when it made sense. Okay, where did it start? I started programming in 1960. I was a student at the Bronx High School of Science. Ben Schneiderman also went a few years later. Science had no computer, so I went to Columbia University and got computer time every other Saturday for half an hour on the IBM 650. The 650, anybody here ever used the 650? We have a few old timers here. It had a drum memory, which made it really slow, and also it uh, had punch cards, so just loading up your program and data was also very slow, no tapes or anything like that. And so in a half an hour every other Saturday, I really couldn't get much done. And that's when I decided I wanted my own computer. This was just not okay. And so when I went to Stanford, again, at the beginning, it was mainframe kind of computer, uh, kind of one person at a time using it, but through card decks being submitted by operators. I was actually one of the operators for a while. And, uh, but this machine, at least, the Burroughs 220, had core memory and tapes. So you could get a lot done in a half an hour. But by getting a job as a computer operator, anytime we ran through all the jobs and I had nothing more to do, I would put in my own decks. So I got lots of free computer time. There's a couple of my friends there from the computer center, Charlie Brenner and Larry Breed. Larry's the one who's closer in the front, operating the keys uh, for a publicity shot that was done on a program that he wrote that Charlie was not really involved in. But Larry and Earl Bobert had developed a program called Machine Automated Card Stunts. We usually called it, or came to call it, the Stanford Card Stunt Program. Uh, I've done a lot of study on this. I, if anybody has counterexamples, I'd love to know. But at this point, I believe it was the first animation language anywhere and the first raster-based animation software. And uh, there were articles about it at the time in newspapers. And I've got a YouTube that has the story of the, the card stunts, if you want to look that up. The pixels were students. Each student had six cards with color on each side of the card. So instead of million color palette or thousand color palette, we had a, a dozen color palette. And then there were little printed cards that were perforated so that volunteers could put them at each seat at Stanford Stadium that had previously been written by hand and of course, there were always lots of transcription mistakes. So this was a very reliable system where the cards were printed by a computer and very easy to read, and it told the students at what point they should change colors. There was somebody yelling out numbers, frame numbers, and then they would, they would uh, flip their card. The language that Larry Breed invented was declarative language, not an imperative language. It had two kinds of declarations, shapes and actions. An example of an action was expand shapes three and four by a factor of five between frames six and 12. And you could put these statements in any order and it would do what it said because it had the frame numbers. But the problem was that wasn't actually the way that you coded the stunts. If you were the animator, you had to uh, use numbers, not letters, because the program didn't recognize anything but numbers. So it really kind of looked like this. So this, of course, was not easy to use. Larry asked me in 1962, when he was uh, about to graduate, that if I would, as a freshman, take over the development of the program and also the operations of the program. And the reason was that, well, he wanted me to make some changes to it. And he suggested I use mnemonics, because there were so many mistakes that the artists were making that he ended up having to do a lot of work himself. So he said, unless you really want to do all the stunt work yourself and coding all the stunts, you better make it easier to use. And that was the beginning of my career <laughs> in usability. So 
so the first thing I did was implement mnemonics. So it was kind of things like that. Span shapes, blah, blah, blah. Actually, it turned out it helped a little, but it didn't help very much. They still made lots of mistakes, and I spent a lot of my time correcting them. So the takeaway, first takeaway from this talk, there'll be more coming through the talk, is unless you want a career in operations built easy to use, bug-free software. So I thought about how, what I should do to figure out why it was so hard to use still. And I decided, well, maybe I should get together with the artists who were coding the stunts. So I got together with one and then another, and I asked them to code the stunts that uh, they were working on and let me watch. And after a while, I started saying, could you talk about what you're doing? Because uh, I couldn't tell. And so I would watch them, and I'd also listen to them describe what they were doing. And that's when I realized that, oh, God, they've got a lot of misconceptions about how it works. And there are lots of places where it's easy to make mistakes in the language. So just for an example, they'd put, a, they'd put in hundreds of numbers for vert vertices of polygons. And if they accidentally left the number out, the x's after that would look like y's and vice versa. And so we talked about it, and they brainstormed solutions uh, with me and uh, came up with the idea of having to require a comma between each x, y pair. And so the, the software could notice that there was only one coordinate between commas. Many things like that happened during the time. Uh, looking back on it, it was basically a, a participatory design session and a little bit of talk aloud usability, but there was nothing interactive about it. The next version of the program was usable enough that I didn't have to code card sense myself, so that was good news. But a couple of years later, another student who was very interested in end user programming, his name was Barry Flashbart, I don't know if anybody knows Barry, uh, he continued in that field uh, for years. Anyway, he organized a few other students and me to do another redesign of the language because he had a theory that imperative languages were easier to debug than declarative languages. And he was probably right about that. But it also to showed me that there were lots of different issues. There was the ease of learning a program, the ease of using it, and the uh, ease of debugging if it was something that involved a script. All of those are still issues today and for those of you who work in novice programming. So that was the beginning of it all. I'm going to skip a little more quickly through the rest of the 60s. In 63, I founded a small company which had the very arrogant name of Information Processing Corporation. I did it because I was 18 years old, and it was, I wanted to be sure I could get customers. And the, the name helped, and wearing a tie to client meetings helped. People actually had no idea how old I was. Uh, but. As the 60s wore on, uh, oh, and the, the thing I was going to say about that was that I did a few other times collaborative design with my clients. As the 60s wore on, interactive, interactive time sharing began to, to replace batch. Pointy devices became common. Mini computers were coming out. And I really got very excited about being able to interact. But most interactive programs had something called modes. And I, they would just always trip me up and I wondered whether they were tripping up everybody else. And when people I asked about, the attitude was kind of, yeah, modes are terrible, but what else is there? So in uh, 1968, Edgar Dijkstra published a famous letter to the communications of the ACM called Go-To Statement Considered Harmful. And that letter had a lot of influence on the design of programming languages from then on, much more than most refereed papers had. So I thought, hmm, maybe I should write a letter to the editor saying that modes are harmful, modes considered harmful. Then I realized that Dijkstra had suggested solutions, like structured programming, <laughs> and I didn't really have any solutions. I didn't have a single idea about how to get, do away with modes. So I better first do that before I write any letters. And that's when I started my research in 68 that went on for, uh, depending on what you count, kind of seven years of trying to figure out how to get rid of modes. In a way, it was a little bit like hardware engineers who try to figure out how to implement CPU instructions in a single cycle. That's called RISC. Around 1963, a Stanford guy named Brian Tolliver had developed a program called TV Edit that was an early keyboard-operated screen editor, no pointing device at that point. Maybe there, was, there were light pens, but I, he didn't rely on those. 
few years later, Pendy Kinerva, who was a research assistant at Stanford, joined from another place. He was a TV edit user, a TV edit user, and he wanted to get TV edit running on the PDP-10. So he did that, and while he was doing it, he got this idea, which was that after you deleted something, you could retrieve it as a kind of undo, but if you moved the cursor somewhere first before retrieving it, then it would essentially move something from one place to another. So he gave me a demo, and TV Edit, like all other programs in that time, had a lot of modes. But, and this one had a mode too, but when I saw you could do a mode in two steps, light went off, and I went, oh, if you break down into two steps and you first move things to a buffer, and then in a later step, which could be any time, no hurry, take the buffer and put it someplace else, you've done a move. So I thought, aha, that's gonna be one component of modeless editing. But it wasn't enough. There were still lots of other issues like how do you insert text and find and many other things. In 68, I began working at the Stanford AI lab for Ken Colby. Now I'd never actually ever taken a psychology class, but he was a psychiatrist and taught me a lot about cognitive science, which was the field that he was one of the people creating at the time. Ken Colby's best known for a program called Perry that simulated a paranoid patient. You might have heard of that. While working for him, I got to know a lot of interesting people. Terry Winograd, Don Norman, David Canfield Smith, who went on to design a lot of the user interface for the star, and Alan Kay, who uh, was in a, an office nearby and um, came over all the time to see what we were doing and would adopt that and insert that into his ideas. And Alan was another one of those people who didn't like modes. There was another guy who didn't like modes. Uh, that was Dan Swinehart. He was a researcher at Stanford AI Lab also. We called Stanford AI Lab SAIL. And just like Penty, he was also implementing a TV edit variant for the PDP-10. And he called that E, and it became the standard develop, uh, editor for the PDP-10 around Stanford. The e-editor didn't do away with modes, but it had a very interesting way to move things. You would make a selection of a bunch of lines, you'd do a command called attach, and those lines would kind of get locked into the screen. And then you could scroll around and do anything you wanted, open other documents, and it would just sit there as kind of a visible clipboard, waiting for the place you wanted it to go to be r right there on either side of this attached text. And then you would detach and the text would fall into the destination. So that was, I thought, a pretty cool way. And also had the potential to either eliminate a mode or have a less onerous mode. But again, Dan, although he didn't like modes, couldn't figure out how to get rid of them, and neither could I yet. And so we started a collaboration over the next few years at SAIL and then later at Xerox Park, always talking with each other about how to get rid of modes and getting showing each other our prototypes and, and ideas. Then something interesting happened. I started volunteering for a nonprofit uh, organization called the Mid-Peninsula Free University. John Markoff's written about that in, uh, in one of his books. And one thing we had to do was issue a quarterly catalog, and every quarter I'd get together with a guy named Jim Warren, who was in charge of that at the time, and uh, he was a math teacher, and we would paste up the catalog. And in doing that, I learned about scissors and X-Acto knives and glue and tape and all the other things that we used to do in those days. And I thought, well, you know, this kind of sucks. Why don't we just get this stuff to come up on a computer screen and you would mark the text you would want, where you want it to go, and, you know, cut and paste on a computer. And then it hit me. Oh, cut and paste. Two steps. Uh, we could have the buffer. We could maybe make this be part of the modeless solution. But over the next few years, I kept going back and forth about an issue that I thought was important, which was people in the publishing industry know a lot about cut and paste. They do it all the time, but most people never heard of it. And so it might not be a good metaphor. And so most of the time I went back to thinking, well, we'll still do something like an insert and a delete, not a cut and a paste, except for people doing page layout, and that will be cut and paste. So that was my model from 68 till about 74 if I could get anybody to listen to me. But I decided that someday the hardware would be capable of supporting this kind of page layout operation, and once that was possible, then I would get a hold of some hardware like that and start doing it. 
So that was my long range plan. In those days, the displays and pointing devices just were not good enough to do that. Well, that was 68, and that brings us to the 70s. In 1971, I got pretty disillusioned with artificial intelligence research. It was gonna take a long time before there were practical applications and we could actually make products that made a difference in people's lives. And I decided maybe I'm just not cut out to be a researcher. I hadn't gotten a PhD, and at this point I decided I definitely wasn't gonna get one. I wanted to go you know, work in a company and do applied things. And I went back to Les Ernest, who was the director of the AI lab, and I told him this. And he said, well, before you go do that, I've got an idea for a program you might be interested in, since he knew I was interested in, in, in uh, publishing. He said, I'd like you to do a document compiler. I said, what's a document compiler? He said, well, it's just an idea he had. It was some kind of programming language that operated on strings and had a library that allowed you to number pages and sections, generate tables of contents, index, cross-references, and all this other stuff. He gave me a long list of features he wanted. I said, well, that should be interactive. Would you let me do an interactive version? And he said, mm, you know, that's kind of more futuristic. I don't think we can do that now. I'd like you to do a batch version. So pick a programming language and, and go do it. So I ended up implementing what we would now call a markup language with embedded tags and scripting. And it was called Pub. Anybody here ever use Pub? Got a couple. <laughs> uh, but using Pub was not a great user experience. It was actually kind of an embarrassment to me because a lot of things, but a couple more. I made a very dumb decision. Somebody approached me and said, you know, you should be compatible with this other uh, markup language that he had just built. And you know, people will start with his, and then they would get promoted to mine, which had more features. And I went, yeah, but your language has so many inconsistencies, I don't want to inflict that on my users. And he said, no, no, compatibility is really, really important. So I said, okay, and so I changed all the commands so that the turning on command had nothing to do with the name of the turning off command and stuff like that. But now uh, most of the users were, of Pub were PhD students writing their dissertations, but some places tried to get their secretaries to use it to help with papers they wanted to publish, and it was hopeless, they just couldn't use it at all. But there was a guy named Brian Reed at, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, I think, who uh, looked at it and said, uh, and actually ran tests with secretaries and said, you know, I could make something simpler. And so he made something much simpler to use called Scribe, and he actually implemented the first version in Pub. It was that powerful of a programming language you could do that. There was another user of Pub named Don Knuth who was, got ideas for designing a program to do mathematical page layout, which he came to call tech. And he, although he was a pub user, he really hated it and swore that he wouldn't have those kinds of inconsistencies in tech. So scribe and tech were so wonderful because pub was so terrible. <laughs> the takeaway though is don't be compatible with a bad user experience. <laughs> Another problem with pub is that it was a compiler. Users had to compile their specification, look at the output, see they were mistakes, go edit the input, run it through again. It was batch. So I thought, you know, this isn't the right way to do it. I really want to do the interactive version. You could immediately see how you screwed up. So I kept looking around for somebody who wanted somebody to do that, but it, it wasn't less. In 1973, I was invited to come to Park. I hoped that I would work on small talk there and interactive page makeup, but the group they put me in was called POLOS, the online office system. The group was mostly from SRI, where they'd worked for Doug Engelbart on NLS. Um, NLS has been mentioned all the time in, in uh, conferences. It's been mentioned a few times this week already. But just to remind you, that was the first system to have mouse. It had tiled windows. It was the first, I think, to have filtered views, outlining, hypertext, and a lot of collaboration features, editing, video conferencing, integration, so on. It was an amazing system, even in 1968, at what was called the mother of all demos. And I loved NLS, and I was glad that the group had chosen it as the basis of their office system, except for one thing. It was m full of modes, the most modes I'd ever seen. It had a prefix command language. You put the command first, and then you put a bunch of parameters. And after each step, you had to you know, make some kind of confirmation or stuff like that. Let me, let me take you through it. 
So here's uh, the syntax chart for the delete command in NLS. Verb was delete. Then there was a noun, which was a scope, character, word, paragraph kind of thing, called statement, and so on. Uh, arbitrary, text, range. Anyway, so you had to know the size of the thing you wanted to delete. Then you would mark it, or you'd mark the ends of it, if it was a text, but usually you would just mark, click in the word anywhere, click in the paragraph anywhere, which was good because mice were very, very crude at that time, and inaccurate, so it was great that you didn't have to point too accurately because you said word and we knew that, you know, didn't care which character it was. So, for example, you would do D for delete, W for word, then you'd click somewhere in the word, and then you'd click OK, which was on the keyboard or also on the mouse. So there was an extra button on the mouse that didn't actually do anything to the screen, it didn't matter where the cursor was, it was an accept key. There was also a reject key, actually a couple of those, and depending on you, whether you wanted to just go back one step or delete the whole command. So the mouse was being used as additional keys, not just for pointing. There was another device in your other hand, which was a five key corded key set that was the alphabet and binary. So you could cord letters. And people usually just learned a few letters of the commands they did a lot. But somebody using NLS would have both hands busy there wasn't really any place on your desk to put a piece of paper because you had devices on both sides of the keyboard. And they were going really, really fast because they didn't have to move their hands away from these devices unless they wanted to type like a whole sentence or two. They just wanted to type a few letters or delete something, do some edits. They could keep their hands still. And they had, a, a, I don't know if they knew Fitz Law by name or whether they just had an intuition about it or just determined it on their own that, you know, moving the hand took some time and moving the mouse. The other commands were similar to delete. Move, insert, and replace would be pretty much about the same, except now you had two things to worry about, not just the thing you were deleting, but the place you wanted to replace, the thing you wanted to replace, or the place you wanted to move, or the text you wanted to insert. So it added another step. In fact, the commands on this chart, including delete, move, insert, these required at least four mouse clicks and keystrokes, and up to seven to do these because of all the confirms and, and so on. And the mode changed at every step. So I knew that this wasn't necessary because at this point in 73, word processors were, com were coming out from IBM, Wang, and so on. And they put the command last and didn't have as many keystrokes because of it. You moved the cursor around, then you gave a command. So this got me thinking, mm, if I want to go what I want is the exact opposite of NLS to get rid of modes. And I should go with this command last syntax. I was having a little trouble convincing people in my group who all were, grew up on NLS that this was a, something that should be changed. So I decided, well, I'll run user studies like I had back in the animation project. So I ran user studies, including a blank screen study, and I don't remember who gave me the idea for a blank screen study. I think it was probably Barbara Deutsch, who was a consultant of ours who helped me out in designing the studies and, and running the first one or two. In the blank screen study, I gave a secretary a marked up printout of some text and told her to imagine that that text was on the screen, and she should go through all the markups and make the screen change in that way. And she had used a word processor at another company. It wasn't modeless or anything, full of modes. But hadn't used one lately. And she was new to Park, and so she had never seen a mouse before. So she started pointing at the screen. And she always pointed at the thing she wanted to operate on and then gave a command. So I thought, you know, at least for her, that seems intuitive. She also did something kind of interesting. She, when I told her she had to delete something, she would take her finger and cross it out. She'd run her finger across it, a gesture. So I thought, that's interesting. But I realized that it would not be a good idea to make that always just delete something. It would be a good way to select something. And there was no drag through at that time. One reason was that mice were so inaccurate that you couldn't drag very well. But we'll come back to that. The picture here is from notes I took during one of the user studies. At this point, actually, Sylvia was trying to learn the NLS-like editor. So I wrote a memo outlining the principles that I thought I learned from the studies. 
and that we should follow in the design of the editor. Here are four principles that proved to be sound. They all seem pretty obvious now, but, and they didn't really surprise me, but none of these were true of NLS. NLS was not these four things that I felt were important. The two most important ones are the first two. Character keys type characters, not commands. And that was really the key to modelessness. I mean, you could maybe have a shift key that let the turn to key into a command, but that was something that you had to do very consciously, hold down that key. And I thought that was probably okay. <coughs> or you could use function keys or menus, but not character keys all by themselves. The other one was that the intuitive use of a mouse is to point at things. So there shouldn't be times when you use mouse buttons to do anything other than, say, make a selection. Or later, people realize, ah, they could also be used for scrolling. Other conclusions from the study didn't turn out so well. Mostly they had to do with training methods. In fact, in this particular memo, as I noticed the other day, the first two principles were contradictory, if you think about it. And the question is, should a space bar insert a space character, or should the space bar move over like on a typewriter and not change anything? This was a big issue in those days because people used typewriters. What we finally came up with, and it was Dan Swinehart's idea, was that sometimes it should type a space and sometimes it should move over. And it should use a heuristic to decide which it, which it was that the user meant. So the heuristic usually worked, and if you want to after the talk, you can ask me what the heuristic was. It takes too long to explain. From the day I joined Park in February 73 until June 73, I worked very closely with a guy named Jeff Rulofsson. Jeff Rulofsson had also come from Engelbart's group, and in fact, he was the one who designed and implemented the command language, command first. So I asked him you know, why he did that and what the users thought of it. He said, oh, I implemented it for the programmers, so they could debug the code. And we were planning on running user studies like we had for the mouse and do the same thing for the command language. But we never really tried a different command language. We just, once this was there, it was the starting point and it evolved and improved, but it never was considered to completely reverse the order of the commands or anything like that. So uh, Jeff was a great collaborator because the people who were from Engelbart's group respected him very much uh, and and knew that he had done the prefix syntax, but he actually was very open-minded about it and very willing to consider alternatives and helped me quite a bit on my mission. So together we wrote a memo called the Intuitive Typewriter. As you can see in these experts, excerpts, cut and paste were mentioned. And in fact, he and I had written a memo in February when we first got to Park where I threw cut and paste into there. So it was starting to become in many but not all of the memos I was writing about user interface to do cut and paste because I was still kind of torn about whether it applied to only page makeup or also editing. This is one of many, many sketches that I did in 1973. I've got a whole sheaf of them at home where I was just trying different ideas for command languages, key assignments, but I was kind of also attached to the fact that there was this five key key set and people seemed, in my group, seemed not to want to get rid of it and the three button mouse, they didn't want to get rid of that either. So I was trying to figure out ways we could label these so that they made more sense in a modeless kind of context. And this was one idea that I had. And there was no move and copy in this version. One of the users who came in to try uh, an editor that I built that uh, wasn't this user interface but was very simple and had basically no modes um, was really happy because in five minutes he was able to make editing happen. It was just a super simple editor called Minnie Mouse. Uh, but when he was leaving the room, he looked over at the screen and he said, you get really good reception here. He thought it was a TV that he'd been working with and had no idea what a computer was or how it was connected to the screen. <laughs> so my plan next was to implement a new editor based on cut and paste. It would make it a little more complicated than this really five minute thing that I had. But there were people who thought, you know, you shouldn't do cut and paste, it's a bad idea. And their reasons were pretty good and it did make me wonder, it kind of probably took cost about a year in when I finally started doing this. Uh, one was that, again, the thing I already knew about, which was 
People weren't familiar with this concept of cut and paste. It wasn't a common set of verbs in those days. And nobody ever heard of copy and paste, even a publishing person. The other problem was that the two steps bothered them. If you cut something and then go scroll around, do some stuff, and then forget that you cut it, before you had a chance to paste it, you might wipe out the, the buffer by doing another cut, say. And yeah, I mean, that could happen, and I, that bothered us all. And there were other issues that they came up with. Uh, one was that modelessness was a good idea, but there were surely applications like drawing where you, it wouldn't work. And I thought, well, yeah, maybe so too. So there was a lot of concern about maybe this was not a great idea. So I spent the next year kind of exploring other ideas and trying to convince people that we should take time and work on this. But my boss wanted me to work on other things. But then something wonderful happened. There was a subsidiary of Xerox called Ginn and Company, a textbook publisher. And they were, like all divisions of Xerox, they had to chip in and contribute money to the operation of Park. So one day they came and they said, you know, we want, you, we want to get something for our money. <laughs> so why don't you take your Alto and implement a page makeup system for it? And, and by the way, also a galley editor. So I was delighted and my boss knew I wanted to do this stuff. So he said, okay, Larry Tesler and Dan Swinehart will do this. And so uh, we started working on it and then decided we needed another person. Uh, so Ginn hired somebody who was kind of an early usability engineer and software engineer called Tim Mott. And they invited him to come to their office in Massachusetts and do an ethnographic study. So he did that and then came out to California, still a good employee at that time, and started working with me on what we ended up calling Gypsy. He was the one that gave it the name. The way we did Gypsy was we took another editor that was just brand new at the time called Bravo, which was better than NLS in terms of the number of steps it took to do things, but it still had modes. And we threw away the entire user interface, which was conveniently in isolated modules, well engineered, and we implemented a completely modeless interface. And it was something you'd very much recognize today. So Gypsy had several innovations. One was you could click to place an insertion point and just start typing. No systems up to then worked that way. You could down, drag, up to select. Well, that wasn't done with a mouse because mice were really unreliable. But our mouse was more reliable, more accurate than the one that they were using at SRI, and, but still not quite enough. So we came up with a heuristic that would do what the user meant to select instead of what they actually did select. And uh, again, you can ask me later what the heuristic was. There was a double click to select a word. And that was something that Tim came up with. I had come up with a lot of other ways to select words, middle buttons, you know, keys on the keyboard, all shifting clicks and things like that. And one day he came in and said, double click. And it became very controversial. What's the timing matter and you know, lots of other things. But uh, it, it ended up being the way we select words. So it was a great partnership. We both come up with lots of ideas. Some worked, some didn't. We had something called the wastebasket, which was where if you cut and paste, it went into the wastebasket. The name clipboard didn't come up until I got to Apple, where we didn't like wastebasket, and we brainstormed and, and tried clipboard, and users seemed kind of OK with that. It also had something interesting, which was this, the find command, which every editor had. Uh, was usually very modey. You'd type, you know, maybe find or control F or something. You would type the thing you want to find. If you made a mistake in what you were typing, you'd have to go back and start over. Backspace a lot, or if you had already finished the command, you'd have to go back and start over. You couldn't edit the find key. And uh, we thought that was important to be able to edit the key, the search key. And so we made it an editable field. And it's called scan. And then between those braces, you could click the insertion point and just type, edit, whatever you wanted to do. And I don't believe that was done before that. If anybody has an example, let me know. So one lesson I learned from that was, I don't have all the answers. I should team up and work with other people. And I did work a lot with uh, several people. So the syntax of Gypsy, which is on the top there, the modal syntax, is what we still use today. 
click or double click followed by a command. Altogether, it required about two fewer clicks than doing the same thing in NLS, but the more important thing was that you didn't have to have your brain keeping track of where you were in this mode tree. You just did one thing, and then your mind is free. Then you do another thing, and your mind is free again. Uh, Tom Moran and Stu Card had just joined Park, and they were very interested in Gypsy. They helped uh, with user, running user studies and so on. And uh, they ended up developing a model which came to be called the keystroke model, which showed that it wasn't just Fitz's law you had to worry about. It was things like think time as well as uh, how many keystrokes there were. And uh, they came up with a formula uh, that would be able to predict performance times. Once they'd done that, it was much easier for me to persuade people that uh, this was a good idea because NLS people were frantically clicking with both hands as fast as they could to get things to happen. But if you could reduce the number of strokes by almost half, then having to move your mouse once in a while wasn't so bad. The takeaway from that is never confuse busy, being busy with being productive. Okay, so we already covered that. This is a summary, you can't read it in the back, but that's okay, uh, of all the commands in Gypsy from the appendix of the, of the manual. A check mark means that we still do it that way today, and most of the things have checks. An X means didn't work out at all. And a check and an X means we, some of it worked out, some of it didn't work out. So these are the things that were checked, and essentially it was the one button subset of Gypsy. The mouse had three buttons, but uh, beginners only use the first button, and except for select word, which was on the second button, double click the second button, um, they were able to do everything. And so uh, we ended up doing the second and third button just because they were there and we should use them for something. And uh, they were used for power user features. We also had a look key we came up with because uh, we had implemented bold, italic, and underline in Gypsy. It wasn't in Bravo yet. And uh, trying to figure out how people should indicate they wanted to do that. Uh, we decided we should take a shifting key and the letters B, I, and U, and that would be bold, italic, and underline. And that has stuck till today, a very long time. So here were the middle and bottom buttons. What they were used for was power users, and you couldn't select between characters. Even a single click selected a whole character. So we were, this was case basically a very transitional product. We were still not willing to quite give up the way it was done before, and we moved it to the second and third buttons. Uh, the first button was the new ideas, and that's where all the users ended up doing their work, not the other ones. So we started thinking about the fact that maybe there should be a one-button mouse because, you know, people hard, don't use the other buttons for much at all. And, you know, some days they'll, someday there'll be touch screens and people will use light pens, tablets, things like that, and having lots of buttons could be a problem. So that became a thought, but we didn't really do much of that until I joined Apple. The Gypsy actually ended up being done at a critical time. It was finished in early 75. Dan Swinehart was implementing something called Woodstock that was an office automation system. So we shared ideas between us, and uh, he made it his thing modeless too, but it could do things like integrate electronic mail with documents. Smalltalk also adopted cut, copy, paste after we put it in Gypsy, and not only that, I think they did a better job. Uh, they still had three mouse buttons, same reason, same kind of uh, structure, but they moved cut, copy, paste into a pop-up menu, which uh, ends up being kind of what we do today in addition to the keyboard accelerators. Here I am in 1975 using Gypsy, uh, there were a lot of things that Park had already developed by that time. Alto, Bravo, Smalltalk, Ethernet, laser printing. Uh, Ron Becker had worked on animation. William du Newman and Patrick Baudelaire had done bitmap editing and vector editing. Lots of other stuff. But these were all demos. Gypsy was in the Ginning Company publishing house being used by other people. And uh, it was close to Xerox headquarters and they uh, got, you know, got to see this. And so. 
uh, top management of Xerox got very interested in uh, Gypsy. And just then, and Woodstock, and just then uh, Business Week heard what was going on at Park and they came over and did a story on what was on Park called the Office of the Future and half of the article was about IBM's approach to the Office of the Future, half of it was about Xerox's. And the Xerox part talked about Gypsy and also talked about Woodstock. In fact, the cut and paste reference was in the Woodstock section. But Xerox was having trouble then because their patents were expiring on copiers and they had a, all hands on deck just to do copiers and, uh, and laser printers. So uh, they were obviously not gonna take these ideas to market. The Xerox Star was coming out, but the Xerox Star didn't use cut and paste. It used, it, they weren't ready to go that step. So I went to Apple. And at Apple, I had to fight a lot of the same battles with engineering and uh, some of the other groups. The good news was that Apple wanted to get a product out ASAP, and when you're on a tight schedule like that, you can't argue forever. So unlike Park, people just didn't argue forever. Steve Jobs would come in and say, I like that, do that. And so that's what we did. <laughs> so I worked very closely with Bill Atkinson, who became the main user interface designer for the Lisa and one of the user interface designers for the Mac. I wasn't directly involved in the Mac, but the Mac people adopted a lot of what we did on the Lisa. But I did manage the user interface development on the Lisa. And once again, we re-ran the tests, got the same results in most part, and uh, came up with a modeless system with cut, copy, and paste. And uh, other people gave feedback. Jeff Raskin has, uh, gave us feedback and so on. Uh, at first, I ran all the studies myself. It wasn't just the main interface, cut, copy, paste, menus, things like that, that we had to do. Uh, we also had to develop six applications to ship with the Lisa. And every one of them had a lot of user interface questions, word processor, spreadsheet, uh, database, and so on. And so I frequently ran user, user studies, uh, wrote them up, distributed them to everybody, made recommendations. A lot of the recommendations got adopted, of course, not all. And uh, we gradually got ourselves a system that was you know, very easy to use and applications that, for the most part, worked a lot like the similar applications do today. But after a year or so, we hired a couple of psychologists to work on training materials, uh, Ellen Nold, Greg Steichleather, and then other people. And uh, they took over the user testing for me and actually did a lot better job because they were training psychologists. Okay. So this was uh, the least user interface. It doesn't show you this, but in the edit menu was cut, copy, paste. But down at the bottom was a clipboard. This is where we first came up with the word clipboard. And the clipboard was visible. We were really worried that people would forget what they had in the clipboard. And it was really important to be able to show the clipboard. So we put it right on the desktop. Double click, see the clipboard. Uh, gradually, as time went on, it turned out that people were rarely needing to know what was in the clipboard. Really had to know, you could paste it. So it got less and less easy to find. And is, uh, some systems don't even have a way to show the clipboard. Cut and paste kind of spread like a disease from then on. People from Park went to other companies and brought it with them. And uh, it took just about 10 years from that Business Week article until it was everywhere. And now it's been 35 years and still, still going. It's even gotten into smartphones. Um, iPhone, also uh, Android, and coming soon to Windows Mobile 7. I assumed that when we started doing touchscreen phones that you would use drag and drop. But the screen's so small that we're, where would you drag to? And I'm sure the companies have probably run experiments to see whether drag and drop could be made to work. But uh, in the end, there's lots of reasons to avoid clutter on a screen, and uh, instead of drag and drop, two-step moves a good idea again, and so cut and paste are still with us. So, what's it like to design a user interface for six billion people? I hope I've given you uh, an impression of, of what it was like. Um, at first, I wanted to design a user interface based on certain principles, and uh, soon my motivation when I went to Apple became you know, we want to make a user interface that's ubiquitous and becomes the standard. And uh, that's what we did. How is creating a user interface paradigm different from designing an application? Well, it's, is it just for a few people doing a very specific thing? Then you can exhaustively test it. Is it going to be for everyone to perform any conceivable activity? Then, well, how do you test every conceivable activity, things that haven't even been invented yet? 
but we did spend a lot of our time uh, on the applications that we were developing on the LISA, and it was a good thing we were developing six applications. And not only that, we, we fantasized other applications and argued about how they would be done in this paradigm, and uh, pretty well convinced ourselves that it could be done. And uh, sometimes it was only a paper design, but we, we thought that was important. If cut and paste was a new paradigm in the 70s, what old paradigm did it replace? Well, you saw. There were lots of various different syntaxes, but the, the NLS was the most famous mouse-driven interface at that time. How did missionary zeal and serial collaboration make the GUI possible? Well, again, I think that came through um, in the talk. In fact, I'm not sure what would have happened if any of the people involved in this weren't part of the equation. Maybe it wouldn't have come out the way that we have it today. I just don't know. What role did participatory design play, rapid prototyping, and usability testing? In short, a very big role. We didn't always use participatory design in the development of cut, paste, and modeless editing. It's a little bit of that. But we did lots of rapid prototyping and lots of usability testing. When you don't know your customer as well as you know yourself, I think you just have to do it. What accounts for the longevity of the result? Well, it's better in several ways. It's not perfect. Uh, like democracy, cut and paste isn't perfect, but it's the best system we have. What's the prognosis for today's mobile UI? Well, your guess is good as mine. In fact, if you're under 25, your guesses are way better than mine. But I do have opinions about where the mobile UI should go next. Uh, one is to ice-free interface, not just hands-free interface, uh, using speech in situations where speech is an advantage. Uh, there's an iPhone app that I use when I jog, which every minute says, you've covered 3.3 miles, and you are running at 4.2 miles per hour. And if I had to go look at the screen to do that, I'd trip over something and fall. So I'm not, uh, I, there are situations, and also driving, of course, where uh, speech is important. I think that more of that is going to happen and is very active. Uh, and I think there are lessons to be learned from NLS uh, about um, ab when we apply it to gesture-rich systems. Uh, there could be different systems of gestures that different companies use, but after a while, it'll probably all migrate to one set of gestures that uh, work across platform. Standards committees probably won't get involved. It'll probably just be the market that likes particular ones and, and drives those. And here are, the, here are some takeaways from my talk. First of all, from card stunts, unless you want a career in operations, build easy to use bug free software. From pub, don't be compatible with a bad use experience, user experience. From NLS, never confuse being busy with being productive. From a lot of things that I talked about, you don't have all the answers, team up. But be persistent, persevere. <laughs> and uh, this one I didn't mention, but there are a lot of problems like uh, getting rid of modes that are really hard, or browsing, which uh, Brad mentioned I got involved in, that was really hard. I mean, Alan would say all the time, no one's ever figured out how to browse. And I finally got so tired of hearing about it, I just went and built a browser. <laughs> but um, if everybody says it's too hard or impossible, that's a good area for research. And finally, the adolescent, <laughs> fight an uphill battle, choo choose a short hill. <laughs> Any, well, first of all, it's almost 10. So, Brad here still? <laughs> Hi, um, Jeff Johnson. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Um, so, since you're really into the the detail of these the modeless editing uh, user interfaces, I'd, I'd like to ask if you think there are any details that are essentially have been forgotten, or at least in some implementations that are commonly used, have been forgotten and therefore cause degradation. Essentially, um, I mean, I I think I've noticed some, but I'll I'll uh, ask right. you. So I think. Uh, drawing with the mouse is still got accuracy issues, even though the technology is so much better today than it was then. 
because it isn't just the mouse, it's the human hand and arm. And the ability to uh, move a mouse to exactly where you want it, especially push down a button, move it where you want it. Uh, there's jitter, it varies with person, from person to person, but there's jitter. And uh, I believe people have abandoned the heuristic that we had in Gypsy and also on the original Lisa uh, to correct for that. And I just think that some more attention should be paid to these very, very fine details. Uh, there are things that are in these interfaces that aren't in the manual because they're subconscious when you use them. Uh, there are several examples like that, but uh, that one, that one is one. I don't, I've never heard of it. Talk about that later. Hi, Michel Baudouin Lafont, Université Paris Sud and Stanford University. Hi. Um, thank you for a great talk. It's uh, always uh, inspiring to see how things we take for granted take so much perseverance in, in the start to make them happen. Um, on the issue of modes, I've always thought that there were good and bad modes. Yeah. Uh, and the modes you were talking about were the bad ones, but our interfaces are full of good modes. And I'm thinking, for example, of tool palettes. Um, and what strikes me with, uh, with tool palettes is that you also uh, get back to the syntax where you select the verb first, the, the, the tool you're selecting uh, is, is the verb, and then you apply it. So how do you reconcile this, uh, uh, these two views uh, uh, that we have in interface of, of tool uh, versus uh, direct editing like you, you, you talked about? I think the issue is, does the user know they're in a mode? If you can make it so the user almost can't not know they're in a mode, then a mode may be a very good thing. And, uh, but what I, what I do in my case is I think about where are they looking? What are they seeing? What feedback are we giving them visually? And if somebody is editing, especially back in the days when we had the typewriters, but even now, if you have a printout, somebody marks up the printout and gives it to you, you've got it on your desk or on a, a page holder, you're looking at that, you're typing like this, you're not looking at the screen. And so if you inadvertently hit a key that changes a mode, you're not gonna know it. So that's a really bad mode. <laughs> but if you're drawing, you better be looking at the screen. <laughs> and to see what you're drawing. And so it's, uh, it's a natural thing to do. Uh, but even then, you want to change the cursor. You want to do other things. So they know they're in rectangle drawing mode. They, they know they're not in ellipse drawing mode, you know, that kind of thing. Thank you. But I would also just enumerate the steps, count the steps, and see if, if the mode only costs one extra step, but it uh, does, has other benefits. You know, it's OK. Hi, I'm Richard Davis from Singapore Management University. I, um, um, I, I want to thank you for this. I, I really like your approach in thinking about, I, I like the universality of your approach in thinking about programming for six billion people. And there's something that's interesting to me about what you've done here is you're balancing a lot of little considerations. And so it seemed necessary to do it in product, in a product category. You talked about how you switch back and forth between product work and research work. Right. It seems, it seems impossible to do this in research, uh, to me, um, because we look at things in isolation. What do you think? Do you think that you could have done this in a research uh, context? Well, Park was a research context. Sayal so and Park were research places, uh, but I was one of those guys at Park who didn't have a PhD. Didn't uh, my own, my published papers were mainly in AI when I was at. Stanford AI Lab, and, but that wasn't my goal. My goal wasn't to publish research. My goal was to get products, and if I'd gone into the product development part of Xerox, I definitely wouldn't have had time to work on this stuff. This needed lots of uh, hard problems to be solved. I mean, hard problems in, in HCI are kind of interesting because when they're solved, the solution is so ridiculously <coughs> obvious, it was in front of you all the time. So when people look at this and go, was that hard? Yes, it was really hard to figure out how to make something really simple. <laughs> and uh, it, so Park was just a wonderful environment where you got to explore. Uh, there wasn't a lot of pressure on people to, to deliver by certain dates or anything like that. As long as we were learning things and making contributions, the management was fine with us taking the time. And so, uh, in, and it would be very hard to do that in a company that was just doing products. But you know, things are different today. There are a huge number of people in the field. And 
ideas, if there were um, a million HCI people back at the time, the solution probably would have appeared in a weekend. Um, it was just, we had very few people to try to solve these really hard problems. And we were all computer people trying to not think like a computer person, and it was hard. Austin. Thank you, Larry. This is great. Um, I, I, I grew up in a world of pens. I mean, I was at TX2, and we started with tablets, and gestures were the way you gave your commands. And the whole issue of breaking it apart into two pieces was, I can show you the, 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 the tapes of the programs before and the programs after. Same set of ideas. What I'm curious now about is whether you have any thoughts about mice, pens, fingers, the way we engage the stuff. Yeah, well, um, Bill Buxton's exhibit shows that there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. And uh, I uh, am one of those people that is just really open to new things. So if people find that there's an application that uses, uh, that has a pointing device or interaction device that works better uh, for that particular application, you know, I'm definitely all for it. But the six billion people thing is much more limited. You probably have to say, well, a very large percentage of those people are gonna have a certain device, touch screen or waving their hands in the air with a connect or, or whatever. Be a certain input modality that's there, and so you need to kind of design within, the, within those constraints. Uh, if somebody comes up with a new input device, unless they work for one of the main platform companies or one of the largest computer hardware companies, they're not gonna have a real great opportunity to spread that around far enough to make it become a standard that everybody uses. Does that answer your question at all? I remember when first, sorry, the thing that I remember when first encountering the mouse at Park, which was about 1975 for me, um, was the complete foreign nature of this thing and feeling immediately, this ain't going nowhere because you don't have them. They're not out there. They're not on your machines. Yeah, that was uh, difficult. I felt the same way when I first came to Park. I was against the mouse and against the key set. But of course, once I started learning them, I was still against the key set, although <laughs> we used it instead of function keys to get cut, paste, and actually scrolling in Gypsy. But uh, as I learned the mouse, I thought, now the only problem is the button, you have to always forget which button to hit. And, uh, but the mouse was starting to become kind of a good thing. But uh, one thing I did was I developed a way to teach the mouse to novices that changed the, the learning time from a couple of minutes down to a few seconds. And uh, I still use it. And it, I've never seen it advertised anywhere as a way to learn the mouse. But today, uh, just people learn a mouse, people learn how to use the mouse when they're four years old. So it really doesn't matter anymore. But if you ever do run into somebody who for some reason never used a mouse, uh, ask him to draw a circle with the mouse and then on the table. Then look at the screen and watch the circle. And then reverse and watch the circle go the other way. 30 seconds of that, they can use a mouse. Try it. Hi, Terry Winograd from Hi, Stanford. Terry. I'm very pleased to see you get this well-deserved honor. And I'm also pleased that I was able to use a lot of these things that you developed over the years. When I came to Stanford in 1973, Larry's office was across the hall from mine, right. and I was a devoted user of Pub. So we should have a Pub users reunion sometime. <laughs> uh, you tantalized me a bit with your first slide and then sort of moved away talking about the lessons you've learned, and I saw Newton up there on your list, and I was just curious how you would summarize what the lessons were you learned from Newton. Oh, many. All right. Um, when you can't find anybody willing to manage a project except yourself, think twice about becoming the guy who does that. Um, another one was if a technology doesn't work yet, it won't work in time for the, sh for the launch of the product. <laughs> Another one is don't trust marketing people who have an agenda and you know the agenda and they're somehow gonna you know, trick you into doing it. Uh, uh, when I reviewed the, uh, the uh, Newton 
uh, marketing literature at the launch, um, it had, before the launch, on the first page it said, Newton, it recognizes your handwriting. And I went, no, 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 it doesn't recognize your handwriting. Uh, take this out. They said, but if we take it out, there's nothing really sizzling. I said, but it's not true. <laughs> and I said, you, this is an order, take it out. And so uh, then when it came time to, for the launch event, uh, I said, I want to, you know, a, one of the copies of the marketing thing, I want to read it, you know, before I go to the event. And they said, the printer, you know, had to make these changes and it's behind schedule. And that kept going on and on and on. And finally, I was actually at the launch event and I said, so where are they? They said, we put them under the seats. <laughs> and sure enough, when I got there and I pulled mine from under the seat, opened it up. Newton, it understands, it recognizes your handwriting or something like that. Anyway, that was, that was the death of it. It was, I knew it was all over. So don't trust uh, market. <laughs> they, they also ran a focus group, and I said, uh, I'd like to attend the focus group. And they said, oh, it's, it's going to be in Minneapolis, St. Paul. I said, but no, that w I've got a lot of meetings. You know I have a lot of meetings that week. Well, we decided we should be somewhere other than Silicon Valley. And they went there, and they came back with conclusions that I'm convinced now were totally made up. <laughs> this, this is exactly what they want. This is what people want. <laughs> <laughs> ben Schneiderman, University of Maryland. Thank you, Larry, for, uh, I, I really appreciated with a lot of the detailed reconstruction of how the cut, copy, paste came to be and the influences and the steps along the way. And it echoes things Stu Card has described about the Brian Arthur's description about the combinatorics and evolution of technology things. It's also my experience in developing the link ideas that there's a lot of little things. And I came to know of your work uh, 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 more in the context of the animations. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about it. I, we, we should have you back for another hour, but I'd like to hear a, a short version of the evolution of the animations for the uh, Macintosh open and close animation, drag and resize. Those seem to be really, I mean, I don't know what the sources are. They seem out of the blue. They were brilliant. They really made a dramatic difference. I think they were central to the transition between the star to the Mac and what made the Mac uh, more, you know, more a compelling environment and even uh, well, the Lisa and the Mac, let's say. So could you talk a little bit about where those ideas came from? Uh, well, actually, there was a slide about the Lisa where you saw, actually, I had the Lisa yeah. grow up and then the, the uh, user interface zoomed out of the screen. Uh, I meant to mention at that point that, uh, that zooming rectangles were done first on the Lisa. Yeah. And uh, the short version of the way it happened was that uh, we had done the Lisa with kind of a very powerful sort of database search kind of uh, way of finding your documents. And we assumed you could have hundreds of documents, and so you we, you filled out a sort of a form that uh, did a search, very much like uh, the way you can do searches in Mac and Windows today in the kind of query version of the, of the search in the, in the desktop management section. But then the Xerox Star came out in 1981, and of course I had seen it, uh, and, uh, but you know, the Apple people hadn't seen it, and we, did, we from Xerox weren't allowed to say anything about it. And a lot of us were from uh, Xerox, four or five of us. So when they saw it, they went, oh man, this is so much sexier than what we have. And uh, the engineering manager, Wayne Rosing, said, well, you just got to finish what you've got going. And a couple of the engineers said, well, if we work at something on, uh, at home on weekends, can we play around with this? And so one day they came in with the icon interface. And uh, so they gave me a demo. And when, this was uh, Dan Smith and Frank Ludolf. And when you double clicked on an icon over here, a window would open over there. And they, they were all excited about it. And I went, there's no connection between the two. I, don't, I didn't even, especially because it's such a slow computer. You double click here, five seconds later, boom, <laughs> a rectangle appears there. I mean, this is too much hysteresis or something. So. Um, I said, why don't you take the icon and, and do what I had in the slide and make a sort of uh, a little image of the window and grow it up. And they went, they thought about it and went, that would be way too slow. This computer is way too slow to do that. So I said, well, just the, just the outline then. 
just take the outline and have z you know rectangles that zoom open. Anyway, Bill Atkinson was there also watching the demo, and he went, mm -hmm, I, want, I want that, yes. So they tried that, and it was, of course, an instant hit, and um, probably led to other things that, you know, in that genre. Well, so well, I will take credit for that one, yeah. but if it weren't for that demo in that room right. in that day, you know, who knows what would have happened. Uh, the reason I think it's important, and I encourage you to at least write it up, because there's a unfortunate historical impression that th that famous visit to, to Park is what led to, uh, you know, Lisa Mack, and that uh, that I think the credit for those innovations, and, and the open was one, but the close was more important than the open, actually, uh, I think. And the drag and the resize were, you know, really good uh, additions to those. But I do think those things made the significant difference because we were early users of the star, we had a big system, but when the Mac arrived, you know, it just sort of said, yeah. That was the dramatic difference. And I think those animations really were key to it. And people should know that you know, that was done by you and by the team you led. And it makes an important difference. OK, thanks. And I think we're out of questions.